Hi friends, days 280 and 281 of Bible study. I'm just give you fair warning, I've got a house full of kids, so you might hear some very real life going on. Lots to cover today. I'm going to try to keep the chit chat to a minimum. I know the videos have been getting a little long and some of you are like, thank you Jesus, stop talking, Kanoi. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. If you could please help us out first though by hitting the like button if this Bible study has been helping you at all. Otherwise, let's go ahead and pray so we can prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, that we get to come here to open up your word, to receive our daily bread, our daily provision, our spiritual nourishment, everything that we need. Lord, you are the word. Your word says it. You were the word made flesh. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So that means that every time we come here to read your word, we are coming here to be with you. And so we thank you for that time of communion today to be with you. I just pray that this will be a good time of fellowship, Lord, that you will speak to us and that we will then respond to you. Please forgive us of our sins, Lord, and I pray that you'll please reveal to us anything that we may not be knowledgeable of, that we may be doing, that is hurting your heart, God, and or may, may be hurting somebody else. And also please help us to also forgive those who have sinned against us. Lord, I thank you so much for this community. I pray that you continue to grow it, and I pray that you bless every person and meet every need. We send up a special prayer right now, Lord, for those in the Middle East, for the nation of Israel, oh God, that is still your child, that is still your people. And as children who have been grafted into the nation of Israel, as your people, as your children, Lord, we pray, God, that the world will have a heart of compassion just as you do for that nation. I pray, Lord, that you will please bring them to repentance, that you will please bring salvation to the people of Israel. But Lord, we also don't want to miss the heart of you and your heart for all people, for all nations. And so we pray for the innocent lives of those in Palestine as well, oh God. Let us not miss your heart in everything. And so Lord, just bless, protect, help God, and I pray for salvation for all people in the name of Jesus. And I just pray that your word will be illuminated today in a powerful way, in Jesus' name, amen. So here in chapter eight of Matthew, we are going to see the first recorded miracle that was written down in the New Testament. We have already read about some of them, but remember we are reading the books out of order. And so this was the first miracle that was recorded by Matthew in the beginning of the New Testament. And Matthew typically writes topically and not chronologically necessarily. So when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. So this leper clearly has some sort of faith and is honoring him in the way that he is kneeling before him, calling him Lord. This is also the first time that we see this Lord looks like Adonai because it is the lowercase o-r-d and first time recorded in the New Testament. So he says, if you will. So he recognizes that God is in control because he knows that God may not necessarily heal him, not based on anything other than that it's just not his will for his life. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I will be clean. <laughs> Important to note apostrophe. I mean, this semicolon here because I almost read it as one sentence, but I will, Jesus said, be clean. So he is now touching him and making him clean. Touching him was probably the most despicable thing that could have been done, but notice that Jesus uses the very thing that this leper had been missing for however many years was physical touch. Nobody would touch lepers. So this is a very genuine faith that he had expressed to say, if you will, he didn't doubt the ability of God, but the willingness of Jesus to be able to heal him. And immediately the, his leprosy was cleansed. And remember leprosy in the Old Testament symbolizes sin itself. And we went over this uh, whenever we read about it in Leviticus, uh, the ways that leprosy is very similar spiritually to sin. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone. So here he is again telling him, don't say anything, but go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for proof to them. So he wants this to be a testimony to the priest. He didn't want to expedite, first of all, the 
Romans coming against him or the Jewish council coming against him by declaring that he is God and that he's working the miraculous. He also didn't want the miracles to outplay his message. Just because he can doesn't mean that he will, you know? So all of these multitudes are already flocking to him and he didn't want to become a spectacle. So he told him to go to the priest so that he could have the prescribed cleansing ceremony that was necessary for anybody who had been made clean from leprosy. And honestly, he was the first one ever, you know, up to this point, ever since that uh, healing happened with Miriam in numbers, we haven't heard about another healing of leprosy recorded anyway, not in the Bible. And so this was the first one that we've heard of. And so this would have been something new that Jesus is doing. And of course, he knew the tendency would be excitement over the physical and the people then missing the spiritual of what was actually happening. Now, when he had entered uh, Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. So this is a Roman centurion, a Roman soldier. And a centurion was typically like a valiant warrior or a commanding officer, very wealthy people. So for him to approach a poor Galilean would have been unheard of. This is very honorable, though, of him to do and to recognize his faith here is something that we have to do because he knew that Jesus could do it and he knew that he could do it simply by saying a word. He understood God's authority, Jesus' authority, and that he could speak healing. And we can do the same, speak healing in the name of Jesus, but God's will be done, right? So if you knew back in this day, Jews felt like the Gentile home was not worthy of their presence. And so he's a Gentile. And that is why he's saying, I am not worthy for you to come into my home. Verse nine, for I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Now, there are only two times that Jesus marvels here, and he does so at this man's faith, but then another time he does it at the unbelief and the rejection by his own townspeople. So it's interesting to see that juxtaposition of when Jesus was actually in awe or marveled at something. And so he says, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. This is a gentle rebuke of the Jews at this point, because he's basically saying, even my own people have not had this kind of faith. Verse 11, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at a table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So here we hear him speaking of hell and the sons of the kingdom. These would be the rightful heirs to the kingdom who are going to be replaced by the Gentiles, which is an unthinkable thing for them at this time. So he is reminding them, listen, your genealogy is not going to save you. And there are going to be people who you are going to be surprised that are actually in heaven. Same thing spoken to us today. I think we're going to be very surprised at some of the people that we see in heaven and very surprised at some of the people we don't see in heaven because their outward display on this earth may not actually reflect their inward heart. Verse 14, and when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. And always neat to point out here that Peter later on is considered the first pope of the church, but Now, you know, in today's standards, popes are supposed to remain unmarried, and yet Peter was married. So the very first pope married, (laughs) the fact that he has a mother-in-law, he touched her hand and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. Now, this is the same way that we can look at when Jesus touches our lives. Those who are actually truly touched and healed will often go on to minister and to share what God has done for them. If they don't do it outwardly by words, they will absolutely do it by simply the way that they live their lives out. Our lives and the way that we live it out is our greatest testimony. 
That evening they brought him to many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Now, I know some people read this and say, why isn't he healing me? Why isn't he healing my daughter? Why isn't he healing my mom? Why didn't he heal so-and-so? Well, one day, all diseases will, in fact, be healed. It may not happen on this earth, but we've got to live for the one day because this is a promise that is spoken that all disease will be healed. So take that to heart if you are suffering through some sort of disease today. Don't take that as a death sentence, you know, that, okay, well, I guess Jesus isn't going to heal me. Still believe and still have that faith, but live for the one day when you absolutely will be healed, knowing that his will for you is beautiful and perfect because you have got to focus on the now and the legacy that you're leaving now and with that hindsight, or not hindsight, with that foresight that one day it is going to be glorious in your future. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. Notice he's trying to avoid the spectacle. He's not trying to avoid people, but the spectacle. And a scribe came up and said to him, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Now he calls himself the son of man more than 80 times in the New Testament, referring to himself as human, trying to relate to us once again. This is showing both his glory, but also his humility here. So what is he saying with this, this, uh, phrase here, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He's basically saying, listen, it will cost you to follow me. You think you want to follow me? This ain't glamorous work that I'm doing here. There are sleepless nights. There are long journeys. There are times of fasting and exhaustion. There's going to be rejection. There's going to be physical pain, spiritual pain, mental pain. It ain't sunshine and rainbows to follow. There is a price to pay, but the reward at the end of the day is much greater. That isn't our number one motivation, but it's absolutely something to keep in mind. The fact that, you know what, this isn't being done in vain. Yeah, there's a price to pay, but the reward is much greater. And the relationship with Jesus, it, you can't pay for that. You know, that is something that is invaluable. Verse 21, another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Now, this man's father was likely not actually dead. What he was actually saying was, as soon as my dad passes, then I'll come and follow you. He wouldn't be in public if his dad had just passed away. So this is saying, you know what? I've got some things to take care of first. I'm not quite sure when I'm going to come because actually I don't know when my dad's going to die. But when he does, then I'll come. So excuses being made here. And really, there are no excuses to be made to say yes to Jesus because you don't know when that time is going to come where you may not have another chance to be able to receive him as Lord and Savior. Verse 23, and when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. <laughs> so lots to unpack just here in this sentence. Well, these great storms would rise up because of the way that this sea was at below sea level. And then the mountains that rose up above it, basically because of the way that it was situated, these, these winds would come down off of the mountain and it would, the cold air from the mountains would hit the warm air of the ocean and it would stir up these storms that would bring up waves that were upward of 25 feet. And if you know anything about waves, they're measured from the backside. So the face of it is actually much deeper than the backside. So we're talking like 50, usually double it, 50 foot faces. If you know how tall 50 feet and you're in the middle of water with a 50 foot wall of water coming at you, that is extremely scary. I'm scared of a 10 foot wave. So not a very calming thing to be going on here. And Jesus is asleep. <laughs> well, one, this shows how human he was. He was still limited by the human capacity. So he needed rest, obviously very tired, having been journeying and healing and doing all the things because it is exhausting doing that kind of work. But he's also resting knowing that he is very well in control. 
So they went and woke him up saying, save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. He's like, y'all just witnessed miracles that I performed in. You're seriously scared at this point. I'm with you. I'm in your boat. Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea. And there was a great calm because that is just like Jesus. He's in our boat. There's a storm around us. He simply says a word that storm calms down and then we have that great peace. And the men marveled saying, what sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? Well, I can tell you who it is. It's a man who is fully God and he is totally in control just the way that the father is. He's got the, the deity of God, but fully man. So he gets us, he understands us. We too need to be like this where when we are facing storms, waves, whatever it is you wanna look at it as, we too can rebuke that fear. We can rebuke the storm. We can rebuke the enemy and the hold that he might have with that fear on our lives. His peace really should have given them peace in that moment. So rebuke the fear, receive the peace of God. And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. So he is in Gentile territory here. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? So they're basically like, Why are you here? Mind your own business. Have you come here to torment us before the time? What's interesting here is that they have theology down. They know their fate before the time of when they're going to be cast into hell. So they're like, why are you early? You know, we know eschatology. We know the end times. So even the demons know Jesus. Clearly knowing Jesus is not the thing that's going to keep us out of hell. You can miss heaven by 18 inches, by the space between your head and your heart. It is your heart that Jesus is after. You know, you can know him in your head all you want, but if your heart is not in tune with him and is not, you know, uh, submitted to him, then that is where you might miss out on heaven. You've got to be able to believe in your heart. And now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. Why do they want to go into a herd of pigs? Well, because demons hate to be idle. They want to constantly be wreaking havoc somewhere, somehow. They are hell-bent on destruction, literally. So why pigs? Because they're in Gentile territory, remember, and pigs are actually an unclean animal. And so if they are able to go into these pigs, the people who actually own the pigs and the people in the Gentile territory who are not men of faith, so they don't care if these animals are clean, these are their livelihood, they're gonna end up hating Jesus. Because if these pigs are driven into death, then people are gonna say, whose fault is this? Why did this happen? And they're gonna look straight to Jesus. That is another reason why they may have wanted to go into the pigs. But what's really interesting here, is, and this is something that gives us hope, is that Demons are submitted to God. They don't have power unless God or Jesus gives them the power. They need his permission. Notice they're begging him. They also have limited knowledge. They don't know all things the way that God knows all things. They are able to, you know, see what they see and hear what they hear, but they can't read your mind and they have to have the permission of God to do things. So just hold on to that because... There is no demon possession that's going to take place unless it is welcomed into a person. And he said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled and going into the city, they told everything, especially what happened to the demon possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. So here now we see the people starting to turn on Jesus. And so he left because Jesus will not stay where he is not wanted. So as we wrap up this chapter here, one of the greatest lessons is the fact that the leper was healed by touch. And there are people out there who need a touch by Jesus today. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know if it is a physical touch that you need, if it is a spiritual touch, 
But if we come desperate before the Lord the way that the leper did, and if we come to him with that need, in need of the touch, he will be full of compassion. He is full of healing, friendship, strength, peace, righteousness, grace, mercy, forgiveness. And you don't have to get clean first to come to him, to get that touch from him. You can come to him as you are and ask him, oh Lord, if you are willing, make me clean. Well, I know he is willing to forgive us of all of our sins. So that is our greatest need is to be forgiven first. But it doesn't discount the fact that we can ask him for that healing. We can ask him for whatever it is that we need. Or maybe there's somebody out there who is in the midst of a storm or who is seeing the waves starting to pick up or the wind starting to pick up a little bit. Hold on to the peace and speak to the waves. Speak to the storm. Speak to that fear. Peace be still. You know, speak the words of Jesus because it is his words that we live by and it is his words that are still so powerful in our lives today. So if you are going through a storm or getting ready to go into one, buckle up, you know, hold on to that security in Jesus. He is in your boat. Know that and rest in that just the same way that he did. Now over in Mark chapter 2, we are going to read once again about Jesus healing the paralytic that we read about two days ago. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. So we got crowds surrounding the doors. And he was preaching the word about the coming kingdom probably to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, and they could not get near him because of the crowd. So what did they do? They go around the crowd, they remove the roof above him, they climb up on the roof, and they remove it by digging through all of the dirt up there. And when they get near him, or when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. First of all, this is some massive faith on behalf of the friends that they are lowering him down and expecting him to walk out because there's no way they can pull him back up or it would be very hard to do so. And they're not gonna be able to get in there to help his friend once again. So they are full of faith that Jesus will heal their friend. So it implied that they were trusting in Jesus as the Messiah. And when Jesus saw their faith, so again, their faith could be seen, obviously. He said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. (laughs) Well, he came here for healing, not forgiveness. But remember, forgiveness is the greatest miracle Jesus ever performed. It is based on our greatest needs as humans. And it comes with the greatest cost of him dying on the cross, bringing about the greatest gift and blessing with the most long lasting results. Forgiveness is huge. And I think sometimes we discount that and forget how important it is for our spiritual walk to be forgiven and to receive that forgiveness and that grace that Jesus provides. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Well, isn't that interesting? Because that's where criticism always begins. It starts in the heart. You know, I'm sure there have been times where you have been sitting in a church sermon, probably sitting in this Bible study, and your stomach starts to turn a little bit when I start talking a little bit too much. (laughs) Criticism will start in the heart. And once you start to entertain that criticism in your heart, in your mind, with your thoughts, or even start to speak it out with other people, then it quickly spreads. It's like the yeast in the bread. It spreads and it will escalate. So you got to be careful of criticism in your heart and in your thoughts, because look what happens. Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Wow, that is a pretty strong statement to make about Jesus and what he is doing. They are simply judging with envy in their hearts. And I thought, why were the scribes even there if this was the kind of heart that they end up having? You know, If they were just going to criticize what Jesus was doing, why did they come into his presence in the first place? Well, because Jesus calls all people. Just because we are going to be critical of what's going on doesn't mean that we're not worthy to come into his presence. And some of them likely had good intentions and maybe momentary and shallow faith. But the moment that something was stirred up within them, that's when they became critical. So Jesus always seeks out people that he can save. He seeks out life. He wants to change people's faith. 
He doesn't want just temporary works-based adoration. So this is truth with refusal to see Jesus as God, because it is true that only God can forgive sins, but they're refusing to see that he is God. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, so Jesus knows all things, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and take up your bed and walk? So remember, he's telling them this is a heart issue here. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. So he's like, you want proof? I'm going to give you the proof right here. And so he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. So he gave them the proof of the immediate validation that they were looking for. He didn't have to, but he did. And so now the significance of the miracle is understood clearly here. Now he went out again beside the sea and all the crowd was coming to him and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and he followed him. Now this again is Levi or AKA Matthew, who is a wealthy tax collector, or some would say an extortionist, because he worked for the Roman government. Even if he was a Jew, he was working for Rome to collect the taxes. So some would say that tax collectors were traitors in a sense. And oftentimes they would extort money from the people by collecting extra or collecting interest on whatever their taxes were so that they could cushion their pockets a little bit. Well, why would Jesus call him as one of his disciples? Because that's what Jesus does. He calls the sinner. He calls the unrighteous. He calls those who are despised. He calls the ones who are rejected. And Matthew following Jesus at this point is a huge risk because he probably can't go back to this position. It was a highly coveted position because it was a get, get rich quick type of job. So once he leaves it, the next man's going in. So for him to drop it and follow Jesus would have been a huge risk knowing that he can no longer go back to that lifestyle. And as he reclined at the table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, when he says righteous, this is a little tongue in cheek here, because remember, none of us are righteous. All have fallen short of the glory of God. So to say he's calling the righteous is a little sarcastic, <laughs> but he called sinners. That's why he is walking this earth. He is here to save those who are in sin. He's doing so by calling them to repentance so that they will change their hearts and their actions and recognize their need for a savior. Now, there are some people who are still very much so like the Pharisees here, like you can't go there and you can't support that business and you can't hang out with those people. Should we as Christians truly keep ourselves separated from, quote, sinners or from people who are practicing evil? Well, the question would be, di the answer would be different for everybody. The question would be, are you able to go into that place and change the atmosphere and live righteously? Are you able to hang out with that person and affect them? Or on the flip side of that, do they affect your character? Is their company affecting who you are in the way that you act? Or is this place that you're hanging out in causing you to compromise your righteousness? That's where the difference would be. This is, this is my opinion, but it is based on biblical fact that Jesus was able to sit with sinners, to go places that were dark and evil because he could change the atmosphere. He could turn the light on. He was doing things righteously. He was getting people saved. He was fellowshipping. He was you know, creating relationships. Jesus always, remember, kept relationships above everything else. Heart came first before religion. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. 
And people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? See, because the Pharisees would fast twice a week. They were very religious, but these disciples are not. And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? He's like, listen, I am the bridegroom. I'm hanging out with my people. You want them to go into a process of mourning? We ain't got time for that. And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, meaning when he is crucified, and then they will fast in that day. So he's like, this is not the time for that. So stop being grumpy. (laughs) Rejoice. And we can be the same way. Rejoice for Jesus is with you. Joy is more important at this point than everything else that is going on. Verse 21, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins because if he does, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is destroyed and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wine skins. So he is saying here, remember, I did not come here to simply go and fix the old rules of Judaism. You know, the Old Testament has prepped them for this moment in time. Just the same way that the Old Testament preps us for what we're going to read in the New Testament. But this new covenant that Jesus is making here cannot fit into the old mold of Judaism. So we have to change. When we come into new covenant with Jesus, we have got to make a change. We cannot keep living the way we lived. And we cannot operate the same as before. Now, one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. So we're on the Sabbath day and they're plucking grain. And the Pharisees were saying to them, look, why are you, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Well, traditionally not lawful. This is not going against Mosaic law. In fact, Mosaic law provides for people to pick grain for food is actually permissible on the Sabbath day. But they are just claiming it as not lawful to be able to pick because they didn't want you doing any kind of work. And since then, there have been all kinds of things that have been added to the list of cannot do's on the Sabbath day for the Jewish people. And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. So first thing to note here is that it says in the time of Abiathar, but if you go back into the time when this actually happened, when David did eat this bread. This was actually during the rule of Ahimelech. He was actually the high priest who was Abiathar's father. So why is he, why did Matthew write Abiathar? Probably because he was more prominent than his father, Ahimelech, uh, or it was just referring to this significance of this time period. Now, Jesus is not declaring that David was innocent in this matter, but he is declaring his authority over the Sabbath. And so he is declaring that human need takes priority over religious ritual. So this is what we call the spirit of the law is above the actual ritual of the law. And Jesus again came so that he could fulfill the law in love. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath, because we got to remember that Old Testament regulations were never meant to oppress anybody. They were always meant for protection and for the betterment of people. The Sabbath day was implemented so that people could rest. It was intended to give us that rest that we so needed. The Pharisees though, are creating a burden out of it. So if we always come back to the motive behind our thoughts, behind our actions, why am I doing this? Why am I saying this? What am I trying to get accomplished? And if you contrast it with how God would do it or how Jesus would do it, that can really start to change the way that you act and think. And so Jesus is like, listen, if I'm the Lord of the Sabbath and I'm not offended by this, you shouldn't be offended either. 
And once again, the Sabbath was made for rest and satisfaction because when God made the heavens and the earth in six days, he looked at it and said, it is good. It was not for just being idle and lazy. That's not why he rested. It was so that he could rest in the satisfaction of what had just been done. So heart check here, are you satisfied with your six days? And that can be symbolic or that can actually be physical, six days, and then you're able to rest on the seventh. But really, if we look at the spiritual part of this, are you able to rejoice And remember that the Sabbath was actually made for rest and satisfaction. It wasn't to just be idle and lazy and sit on your couch all day. God made the heavens and the earth in six days, and then he rested after he said it is good. It was for him to rest in the satisfaction of what he had just completed. So now we are going to head over to John chapter 5. The healing at the pool on the Sabbath. So another miracle taking place on the Sabbath and people getting all riled up about it. Now after this, there was a feast of the Jews. We don't know what feast this is. It could have been Pentecost, Tabernacles, but regardless, it was a feast where their presence was necessary. So there were were a whole bunch of people here. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool. Sheep Gate was the area where the sacrifices were brought in, by the way in Aramaic called Bethesda, which means house of mercy, written right here, which had five roofed colonnades or porches. There was like two on each side and one in the middle. In these laid a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Wow. I don't know how old this guy is, but to have been lame for 38 years. It's a very long time. That's almost my entire life. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Now, I don't know why Jesus is asking him this. I don't know if it's because maybe he is sitting there begging and making a decent living begging, or if it is because he is trying to build the faith of this guy saying, hey, you know what? Do you really want to be healed? Because here's what's going to happen if you do. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. So he is basically saying, when the pool bubbles up, which they believed that the first one to get into the pool, when it bubbles, they will be healed. And the bubbling would happen because of some uh, shifting that would happen underneath, some stirring up. And so they believed that. This was a traditional belief. And I don't know if it is something that actually happened or if this was just a faith-based thing that people were healed. But regardless, people would get healed here and people would sit here and wait for that miracle to happen for them. And so he's like, I am constantly in competition and no one will take me in. You know, it's every man for himself right here. So look what Jesus does. Jesus seeks out this one man here. You know, he's that is so the heart of God to seek out the one nation of Israel, to seek out the one man who will do the job. It's always like that. He picks the one, but then he'll surround him with other people to be able to help support the mission. But Jesus goes to the one in the back. You know, he goes to the non-competitive one. He goes to the one who isn't striving to be able to get in there. So... Verse 8, Jesus said to him, get up and take your bed and walk. I love how many times he says this to people. He's like, I need you to believe me for the impossible. Notice that Jesus didn't pick him up and take him into the pool. That's not what he did. What he was doing was removing him from the competition altogether. And sometimes Jesus will do that to us. He will pluck us up out of a place to remove us from the competition that is around us so that he could then do his great works. He wanted to take him out. So verse nine, and at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath, go figure. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. Because traditionally, there was something written that said that they were not to bear 
a burden, bear no burden on the Sabbath. So picking up his mat and walking would have been considered a burden because again, they had all kinds of traditions, still do, about what they can and cannot do on the Sabbath. I think like turning on a light switch is one of them. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? So they're again, mad at the miracle, which just baffles my brain. It's the same way that people get mad about this Bible study, like criticizing what we're doing here. We're, I'm like, why are you mad at getting people saved? Now, the man who had been healed did not know who it was for Jesus had withdrawn because that's what Jesus would do. He'd perform the miracle and dig out, avoiding the spectacle as there was a crowd in the place. And afterward, Jesus found him in the temple. So notice that the man is now worshiping. He was healed and is now in the, responding through worship and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. Now, this does not imply that it was his sin that caused his paralyzation, but it could mean that. Uh, but really, what he is saying is, I need you to walk in a new way so that your consequences don't compound. Because if you continue in your sin, you're going to end up worse off than if you were ever paralyzed before. So no matter what, Jesus is saying, stop sinning, stop it so that you don't get worse. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. So if anybody ever wondered why the Jews turned on him, this is the reason. One, because they, he violated their traditions. You know, he is doing things out of order of tradition. And then we see another reason because he was doing these things on the Sabbath, but Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working. So notice how he is acknowledging his father, how he is doing good things on the Sabbath. He never stops working and doing the good things and therefore he is working. So he is saying, I am in unity with my father. He is declaring throughout this that he is the same on the same level as his father, but also still recognizing the separate nature that the father is who he is, Jesus is who he is, yet they are still on the same level and the same God doing the same things. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, so here's the second one, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So we're going to see uh, all kinds of evidence here of the Godhead, three in one, Jesus being on the same equal as the Father. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. So he reflects what the Father does. And he's also connected to the Father. He can do nothing on his own. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. So he has got security in the Father no matter what. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. So he is in harmony with the Father. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Now remember John 3, 16 says that if you believe in Jesus, you will have eternal life. Here, Jesus says, if you believe in the Father, you will have eternal life, the one who sent me. So again, three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but Father and Son, the same. If you believe in the Father, then you believe in the Son. You believe in the Son, then you believe in the Father. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So judgment meaning when you receive Jesus as your savior, you are free from that eternal judgment of determining whether or not you will go to heaven and hell. Uh, and if you receive Jesus, you have eternal life with him in heaven. So that judgment for eternal destiny is abolished at the cross. However, we will still stand before him so that he can judge our inheritance 
into the kingdom. So again, that reward system will be in place in heaven and we will still be held accountable for what we say and do. But don't be scared of that. It's a good thing because we get to see the amount of grace and the gift and what it truly is through Jesus and what he did at the cross. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now it is here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. So the Father is the source of life. He is living from the Father. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. So he's got authority from the Father. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So those who have done good are those who have believed in Jesus because you can do all the good things, but apart from Jesus, the good things aren't going to matter. It's got to be good in connection with your belief in Jesus. Verse 30, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So he is submitted to the Father. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. So he is recognizing John as the one who went before him. Where John is the lamp, Jesus is the light. He was burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me, that the Father has sent me. So all of these things I'm doing, they were written. Like you, they, this should be the testimony that you are seeing about me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me as well. So he knows his validation comes from the Father alone. He doesn't need to try to please man. He knows that what he is doing is, in fact, sharing as a witness, sharing that testimony. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one who he has sent. So basically, you might know the word in your head, but you are completely missing the point because it's not in your hearts. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So if they were to actually search the word with the right heart, they would have seen Jesus. They would have known that this was him who is the son of God because it was written. I mean, 300 plus prophecies written and fulfilled by Jesus. So this word search here is the Greek word uh, iriuneo which means to track the scent or follow the scent. For us, that means following the scent of blood that was on the cross so that we will have eternal life. That's the whole basis of our eternity. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you or the love for God is the way we can look at it. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. So he's, his identity, he knows, is in the name of the Father. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. So this is speaking of the Antichrist because the Jews and the people will actually believe in the Antichrist as the Messiah. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? So basically, he is like, you all are, you know, receiving all of this praise and this adoration from people. And because of it, you've got pride. You're operating in vanity, in self-love. And notice how concerned he is for the glory of God. He's like, you don't seek the glory that comes from God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you already, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So the very one who had been given the law to speak to the people was Moses. 
which they profess to keep that law, to keep that word, that's the very thing that is going to accuse them in the end on judgment day. Oh, Jesus, we just thank you for all of the miracles that you performed to be able to declare who you were as the Savior of the world, as the Messiah, as the Christ, the Anointed One. And yet you still perform miracles today and we miss it all the time. May our eyes be open. May our ears be in tune with your voice and may our hearts be open to be able to see the things that you still are doing as you still walk this earth, as you are still alive and you're still actively moving in the hearts of people. May we be those people, Lord, who are starting to stir things up, kind of like the pool, where we are starting to bubble things up to get people healed, Lord, to bring people to the faith, where they are able to see physically what you have done, so they can say, I see the faith, just the same way that it was written here, that it was spoken here. And we just thank you, Lord, for understanding of your word. I pray that we will be able to really just meditate on what was spoken today and that we'll be able to sit in your presence and hear exactly the certain part in the scripture that you were intending for us to read on this very day in this very moment may we understand the significance of that word may it be a miracle in our life that does some changing in us oh god i thank you lord that just like the man at the pool, that we don't need to try to fight our way to healing, that we don't need to fight our way to faith. Jesus, you are already there, ready to meet us at the pool. We don't need to compete and get our way to the top the way that the world tells us to. Lord, you single us out. You call us right where we're at and you heal us. You give us a new walk, Lord. You give us new legs to rise up. Thank you that we can let you be Lord and that we don't need to demand our own way, Jesus, because your way is already perfect enough. May we never be people who are critical or mad at the miracle, but to have the grace and the compassion that you have, Lord, for people, that we will have the heart of the Father and continue to do good no matter what. And I just pray once again, oh God, for whatever is happening in the Middle East and all over the world, May people come to repentance. Oh, Jesus, will you touch the hearts? Lord, protect the Christians who are trying to witness at the borders, Lord, who are being spat on by the Jews. That is another way to look at this, God, that there are still people rejecting you. And our hearts just cry out, oh God, as we have compassion for the innocent, but we also have compassion for those who are doing the hard work, who have boots on the ground and we're trying to still witness, Lord, and being persecuted for it. Will you protect them as well? Oh God, give us a heart more like yours. All of us, Lord, the world, may we be more like you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, we pray these things. Amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.